the topic of today's lecture, I want to announce a guest lecture that we will have tomorrow. We will have the senior legal counsel of Aalto University, Maria Rebinder, telling us about the legal aspects of machine learning. And uh, this is uh, very important uh, because in this course, you learn some powerful methods. And I like to use this picture of uh, a chainsaw, uh, which is not too difficult to start like uh, using a machine learning method in Python. It's also not too difficult if you have some coding skills. However, you can do, uh, uh, you can harm uh, things or you can do harmful things with a chainsaw if you not use it properly. In particular, you should be aware of <clears throat> that some data is sensitive and you, you are not allowed to analyze it. So there is sensitive data which is protected, for example, by GDPR. And uh, tomorrow you will hear some basic uh, guidelines or some basic rules that you must follow to uh, use machine learning uh, in a legal way. Okay, so you cannot uh, use any data and uh, make some analysis and these machine learning methods allow you to, to look behind the data and get some insights, but sometimes you, you are not allowed to use these insights. Okay, so let's now go to the topic of today, which is about regression methods. And uh, this will be a particular instance of this basic setup of a machine learning method. So does any one of you remember what are the three main components of machine learning? Data, yes. One component is data. Another component, a loss function, yes, and also hypothesis space. So today we will talk about particular choices for data and how to represent data and uh, hypothesis spaces and loss functions. So today we look at first special cases of these components. So <clears throat> let's consider a, a data points representing a ski day, so some ski day ahead. The features could be a snapshot in the morning that you take out of your window. Uh, the features can also be a, a weather forecast that you get, for example, from, from Google weather. And the quantity of interest, the label could be the maximum daytime temperature, which you do not know yet because it's in the morning. And in the morning, typically you have the minimum temperature uh, in Finland during winter. You, you typically have the minimum temperature in the morning and the maximum temperature somewhere around lunchtime. And we use here as label the maximum daytime temperature because this is important to choose the right wax for the skis. So this is a regression problem because the label is a numeric quantity. So the label here is, is something like a number the maximum daytime temperature. And when you use numeric labels, the resulting machine learning problems and uh, corresponding methods are called regression methods. And this is, might seem somewhat uh, trivial or uh, not very exciting to use numeric label values. However, it turns out that this gives you a lot of opportunities for, for doing machine learning. In particular, you can compare different, different predictions or different values for the label. You can, for example, say the prediction 10. So if you predict the maximum temp daytime temperature being 10, so my guess is that the maximum daytime temperature will be 10. And then some, somebody else predicts the maximum daytime temperature will be 100 then you can say my prediction, the prediction 10, is closer to the label if it is 11. If the true maximum daytime temperature is 11, then you can say the prediction 10 is closer. Uh, so there's somebody having problems with the sound. Uh, does anybody else hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Okay, so it seems oh, this is an individual problem with the sound, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, uh, so we can compare label values. 
And there are other machine learning problems where the label is not a number. The label could be a class. This is then uh, called classification problems or classification methods where you want to classify images into uh, two categories. For example, one category cats and another category dogs. You don't have a, a distance measure between those label values. You cannot say a cat is farther away from a dog than from a, a zebra. So you cannot compare these label values as in regression where we have numbers. So this is nice to have numeric, numeric label values because then we can measure uh, we have a lot of uh, possibilities or, or intuitive ways to measure the, the prediction error or the loss function. So is there any question up to this point? <clears throat> so regression problems or regression methods are a special case or a subset of machine learning problems or machine learning methods which use numeric labels. So the label is a number and often we, we use a real number to represent the label. Okay, so as I tried to discuss or make clear in the last lecture already, machine learning or a large part of machine learning is about fitting a, a model to data. And with model, I mean here a set of, of predictor functions. So we have, typically many different predictor functions available. Otherwise, machine learning would be trivial. If we only have one predictor function, we have to use it. So machine learning only becomes interesting when we have more than one predictor function. And then machine learning is about finding the best predictor function out of, of a set of predictor functions. How do we call this set of predictor functions that we use? Hypothesis space, yes, exactly. So the hypothesis space is exactly the set of, of predictor functions that we, we consider so that we can represent easily. Uh, today we will talk a lot about a particular hypothesis space which is obtained by linear predictor functions. But these here, so here are one, two, three, four different predictor functions and they look non-linear. So this might be a hypothesis space of four predictor functions and the machine learning then amounts to finding the best out of these four predictor functions. Um, in general, we have way more than four predictor functions, infinite number of predictor functions. So a regression problem amounts to finding a good predictor that fits well a set of, of labeled data. So we compare the predictor function. So here's a possible predictor function. So for any, any value of the feature, feature X is the morning temperature. This is which I can measure easily in the morning. I can look up the morning temperature. And what I would like to know is the maximum daytime temperature. So I, I use this predictor function. So I go here up this for this value of, of the morning temperature and get a prediction for the maximum daytime temperature. But here I have already a data point for which I know the maximum daytime temperature. How is that possible? How could I know uh, the maximum daytime temperature for some day already? Exactly, historical data. I can use observations from earlier days because uh, but that, that's of course an assumption. So I assume that the relation between minimum uh, morning temperature and maximum temperature is somewhat similar today as it was last day, as it was last year at the same uh, uh, month. So this is an assumption, but it's typically well, uh, uh, well met by, by weather data. So you can look at uh, weather data yourself. You can download weather data. And here I have uh, shared a notebook or a link to a notebook by one of uh, our students, Rupe Terro, which is a PhD student in my group and which works at the Finnish Meteorological Institute. And you can try out this link. It, it guides you to a notebook, a Python notebook, which shows you how to download uh, historic uh, weather data from all over Finland. So you can specify an area, geographic area, and the uh, 
time period and you get all the measurements uh, collected during that time period in that area. Pretty neat tool. You can get very nice data from this. So you might find this useful for your um, project. If you decide to do a, a machine learning project in this course, uh, you might formulate the machine learning problem using this FMI data. Okay. So now we know where to get data, but then of course we need to choose a hypothesis space. So how many different predictor functions are there? Let's assume for this uh, maximum daytime temperature application, we have one numeric feature X and one numeric label, which is the maximum daytime temperature. How many different predictor functions are there? What's the maximum possible uh, uh, hypothesis space? Infinite, yes, and very much infinite, so uncountably infinite. Uh, the number of real valued function with a one real valued argument is extremely large. And we cannot represent this maximum hypothesis space in a computer which only has a finite number of bits. We need to find more efficient representation or subsets of predictor functions that we can represent easily. And one such subset, which is very useful, which turned out to be super useful, is uh, given by linear predictor functions. A linear predictor function is basically represented by a straight line. So if we have only one feature x, then a linear predictor function is given by, by this formula. So some weight times the feature x, plus we add some intercept term. So here we have the intercept term, which is the function value for a feature x being zero. And the weight is the, basically the slope of this predictor function. <clears throat> so this is only for one feature, and we can extend this easily to more than one feature. So let's say we have n different features, then we define a linear predictor by a weighted sum or a linear combination of all these features with some weights, and these weights we can tune. This is what we adapt, what we learn in machine learning. These weights is what we learn and the intercept term, possibly an intercept term. Sometimes uh, we, we just use linear predictors without an intercept term, and instead add, we can add a feature which is always equal to one. So we could say, for example, this first feature is always equal to one, so this W1 would then take the role of the bias. Okay, so what is nice about linear predictors that we can characterize one predictor function, a whole function. So this is a, here represented by a line, but it's a function, a map, uh, from a real number to another real number. And we can represent such a function by numbers. So we don't need to store infinite many numbers, but only uh, a finite amount of numbers. For example, if we have one feature, then we only need one number for the weight and one number for the bias or intercept term. So only a fine, a typically small number of, of numbers or a small amount of numbers can be used to represent a predictor map. And we can handle a finite set of numbers easily in, in computers. So our computers, uh, what you're currently using for, for watching this uh, Zoom lecture, the, the computer that you're sitting in front of, they are perfect for handling uh, sets or sequences of numbers, finite sequences of numbers. This is what computers are extremely good at, uh, the computers we use at the moment. And it also has a nice structure, a mathematical structure. So the set of linear predictors uh, can be structured like an Euclidean space. So we have, we have some notion of distance between predictor functions. We can say one predictor is more similar to a predictor than another predictor. So we have uh, some geometry, geometric properties of predictor function, which helps us in navigating this space of linear predictors or this hypothesis space of linear predictors. Yeah, by the way, uh, we now uh, reduced the set of possible predictors to only linear predictors, but how big is this set of linear predictors? How many linear predictors are there? Infinite, still infinite, yes, exactly, still infinite, but we can approximate them uh, in an effective way. We can approximate each weight, which is a real number, we can approximate each weight by a rational number or a finite 
a number of bits, like a floating point number. So we can handle them more uh, efficiently using our computers. That's why many, I would say the majority of machine learning methods is based on, on uh, structures similar to linear predictors. So representing uh, predictor functions using uh, finite sequences of numbers. Okay, uh, the important thing here is that this number of features uh, is what characterizes the, the complexity of this hypothesis space. So the, the geometry of this hypothesis space is basically defined by the number of features or the dimension of the space. And this number of features, this can be a lot. So how many features do you think we need or we get when we, when we use as features individual pixels of a of a snapshot taken by a smartphone. How many features do we get out of such a snapshot? How many pixels does a, a, a camera have nowadays? 10, 100? Megapixels, so millions or even billions. So what we typically get when we, when we use the raw data or naive ways to construct features, we get way too many, way too many features. So we need to reduce the number of features and we will learn how to do this automatically in round six. But for now, we, we assume somebody tells us what, what a good set of features is, what a few good features are. So <clears throat> let me discuss a bit the role of the weights. So each linear predictor is characterized by a weighted combination or weighted linear combination of the features and the weights here, they determine how strong the influence of a particular of the corresponding feature is on the result. So this weight W1 uh, determines how strong does X1, the first feature, go into the prediction or influence the prediction and similar, the weight W2 influences how strong the feature X2 influences the prediction. And this is some form of uh, interpretability, or we can explain the prediction that we get from such a linear predictor by saying, well, we got this prediction because the weight W1 is very high and the feature X1 was large. That's why we get a, a big prediction. So these weights, allow us to, to characterize or to interpret the, the importance or relevance of features of data points. <clears throat> so there was one question, can you give an example of a weight in real life machine learning? Well, these weights, they are learned, they are learned uh, by the machine learning algorithm. So typically you, you do not choose them yourself and it's, it's hard to, to tell how, the, how, how we arrived at those weights. But for example, if we, want to, if we want to detect a tree in an image and we use as one feature the green, the average greenness of the, of the image, then for example, the weight corresponding to this green feature will be large or we expect this to be large. So this weight corresponds to the, the relevance of a feature. Okay, there was another question. Uh, what, what is represented by X1 and X2? So this X1 and X2 are two features of a data point. So assume I have a data point which is characterized by two features. For example, an image, uh, a digital image could be represented by the two features, the average green component and the average red component. And you could use the average green component to, to determine how much vegetation is in the image, for example. So X1 and X2, they are just two numbers which we use as features to characterize, characterize a data point. <clears throat> yeah, so exactly. So here this H of X is, a, this linear predictor is a function of X1 and X2. So this X here is in bold phase which should represent the vector. So this X here uh, is, is the vector consisting of X1 and X2 stacked. Yes. Uh, okay, and 
yeah, so this course is called Machine Learning with Python. So how, how does it look like in Python? Uh, well, a linear predictor is, is represented by a Python object. As you heard by Shamsi in the uh, Python introduction, everything or almost everything in Python is represented by an object. So also a linear predictor is represented by an object and this object is called linear regression. And it's contained in the Python library or package uh, skikit learn or sklearn for short. And this sklearn library, this will be your main friend during the whole course because this library contains objects for all, basically all the machine learning methods I will talking about now in this course. And uh, these weights, for example, the weights for each feature, they are stored in an attribute called linear regression.coef underscore. So if you, if you want to access the weights, you just uh, read them out from this uh, attribute. And the bias is stored in the attribute linear regression.intercept. Okay. Uh, so this sounds a bit restrictive uh, that we only consider linear, uh, linear predictors because uh, sometimes the data might not be linear. So the, the relation between feature and label might be nonlinear. So there's many aspects in life that are nonlinear, unfortunately. Uh, or on the other hand, it makes life interesting, maybe. So we can expand the, the scope of linear predictors by uh, constructing features. Uh, as I tried to make clear in, in the first lecture, it's a design choice what we use as features and you can construct new features as you wish. For example, in polynomial regression, we consider data points with a, a single numeric feature like we had in this uh, maximum daytime temperature prediction where this feature was uh, the minimum daytime temperature. So we have one single feature, the minimum daytime temperature, but we can construct new features. So let's construct features by taking powers of this uh, minimum daytime temperature. So the power C to the zero, uh, which is always one, except, uh, one. so this X1 uh, helps us to get the, the constant term, the bias term. Uh, then we have C to the power of one, which is C itself and so on, we continue with higher power, uh, powers up to n minus power uh, n minus one. And we can use these new features to form a linear predictor. So we use now a linear predictor in the new features. And in the original feature space, so with respect to the original feature, these functions, these linear predictors are highly nonlinear because the linear predictors are formulated in these new features, which are powers of the original feature. So we can form now, uh, using linear predictors, we can form any polynomial up to degree n minus one uh, in the space uh, defined by the original feature. <coughs> so we immediately expanded the scope from linear functions to polynomials. And we can now represent more nonlinear uh, relations between the, the minimum daytime temperature Z and the maximum daytime temperature Y. <clears throat> yeah, uh, so it's intuitively clear that using nonlinear or polynomials uh, can only help us to, to fit data points. And does anybody of you know how many data points can I fit with a polynomial of degree n minus one? Perfectly. So how many data points can I fit perfectly using a, a, a polynomial of degree n minus one? Or let's, let's make it easier. So let's consider a polynomial of degree, maximum degree one, uh, which are exactly straight lines. So how many, how many data points can you fit perfectly with one line? Two, yeah. If you give me two data points, I can, I can show you one straight line that goes through the, through the two points, okay? And in polynomial predictors, we can extend this and say with a polynomial of degree n minus one, we can fit perfectly. Uh, we can fit perfectly any set of n minus one data points. So this should already tell you that n minus one data points might be not enough, or just the, the border case, to learn a linear predictor. Because 
if you can perfectly fit n minus one data points using a, a, a randomly or an arbitrarily chosen uh, polynomial, then you typically cannot learn a relation, uh, a, a true underlying relation. Like you cannot really learn uh, a straight line from just observing two points reliably because you will overfit. And we will talk more about this in round four on model validation and selection. But you should now get some, some intuition that choosing a, a certain maximum degree for polynomial predictors tells you how many training data points you need to reliably fit those uh, or find a good polynomial predictor. Yes, I, I want to show, uh, I'm really a fan of, of linear predictor functions and I, I find them highly un underappreciated nowadays because everybody is so eager to, to learn deep learning. I just want to point out that you can do basically anything with linear predictors. Because if you look again at the case of a single numeric feature, you can construct features by indicator functions. So you can construct a new feature, which is one, if the original feature is in a certain small interval and zero otherwise. And if you then form a linear predictor in these new features, xj, what you can build are piecewise constant functions. And if you make this interval very small here, so if you choose n large, like a billion or so, then you can make this piecewise constant function a very good approximation of basically any, any function between c and the, the label. So you can represent any nonlinear function with a good approximation quality. Okay, uh, is there any questions or are there any questions up to this point? <clears throat> okay. So now we have talked about data. We have talked about uh, uh, hypothesis spaces of linear predictors. So we can extend these hypothesis spaces by using polynomials, uh, new features which are polynomials, or uh, new features which are indicator functions of piece by, uh, of, of uh, intervals. <clears throat> so there was one question, uh, why is it possible to fit n minus one data points perfectly using, a, using a, a polynomial of degree n minus one, maximum degree n minus one. Um, so actually it's, it's, no, it's wrong. So you can fit, you can fit n data points perfectly using a polynomial of degree n minus one. Yes, because you can fit two data points using a polynomial of degree one, which are all straight lines. So you can find a straight line passing through arbitrary two data points. If you have three data points, then you can fit uh, a quadratic, uh, a quadratic function through these three uh, data points. If you have more, then you need a, a higher order polynomial. So this is related to the fact that. So I, I think it's called the uh, funda, uh, fundamental theorem of algebra, which tells you that uh, a degree n polynomial has n different roots. But this is far beyond the scope of this of this course. But if you if you had a, a math course, then you might remember that you can find a, a number of roots of a polynomial that is exactly the the number of uh, or the degree of the polynomial. And this result can be translated to the fact that you can fit any n minus one data point or n data points given a polynomial of degree n minus one. Okay. Yeah, so how do we learn a good linear predictor? We have now talked about a data. So we can get data, for example, from uh, Finnish Meteorologic Meteorological Institute. We have talked about hypothesis spaces, which are given by linear predictor functions or linear predictor functions in new features, which then look nonlinear in the original features. 
So what is the third component of machine learning that helps us to, to find a good predictor? Loss function, yes, exactly. We need a loss function that tells us how good is a predictor. So consider here one, two, three data points that we downloaded, for example, from the Finnish Meteorological Institute. Uh, <clears throat> for each data point, we know the minimum daytime temperature X and we know the maximum daytime temperature Y. And we somehow came up with a, a predictor function, h of x. <clears throat> and this predictor function typically will not perfectly fit this uh, data point. So we will have a prediction error. We will have a difference between the predicted uh, maximum daytime temperature, y hat, and the true daytime temp maximum daytime temperature. Uh, so there will be a prediction error. So there's one question, if you have a set of features that follow a nonlinear predictor, would it then be possible to convert the nonlinear predictor uh, to a linear one? Uh, yes, this might be possible if you do a proper uh, construction of, of uh, new features. So you can de-squeeze or, or, or flatten out nonlinear functions. Yes, but I'm, I'm not aware um, at the moment ad hoc, I don't know where this could be used. I, I rather know the only the other direction where you want to build nonlinear predictors by using um, new features, by mapping the original feature to new features. This, for example, is the basic idea of kernel methods. So there are also courses on kernel methods at Alto, but they are more advanced. So the idea of kernel methods is also to map the original feature into new features and then use and for these new features use, uh, typically you get many features, many new features, and then use a linear uh, function or linear predictors on these new features. And this is then called kernel, kernel methods. Okay, uh, yeah, so this was again about the hypothesis space, but now let's continue here with the loss function. So the loss is some measure that takes this, uh, this error, this difference, and assigns it a non-negative number, like a distance, a distance measure. So which distance measures do you know that take this difference, this prediction error, and give you a, a measure of the size of this error or a distance measure? What could we use? For example, the Euclidean distance or the squared error, yes. Uh, in general, we are free to, to define the loss function. You can, you can define the loss function as you wish. There is, in general, no mathematically correct choice for the loss function. You can design it. <clears throat> However, there are different uh, implications of the loss function. For example, some loss functions are easy to minimize. So for some loss function, it's easy to find a, a predictor function that minimizes the losses. Uh, whereas other loss functions are such that they allow, and we will talk about one such loss function, they are tolerant for outliers. So some data points might be very different in the training data and you don't want to fit them too much. So some loss functions have good robustness properties. And we will talk about a few such choices. So, but in general, the loss function is fully under your control. You as a machine learning engineer or scientist, you choose the loss function as you wish. So there was one comment. Uh, so the prediction function takes last year value of data max and true. Is this year's data max value or? So the true value here, so this one, for example, this data point might be uh, downloaded from the Finnish Meteorological, Meteorological Institute and might be one year ago, but also somewhere in winter. You should compare winter days, but from different years. So uh, for this data point, you know what the maximum daytime temperature was because it was last year. And you know what the minimum daytime temperature was. That's how you get the true, true label values. So true label values you often get only in hindsight, so from historic data. But the problem then is that this historic data might be a bit different in structure. So what, what could be a problem here if we use historic data for finding a predictor from minimum daytime temperature to maximum daytime temperature? Why could the, the historic data, for example, if we, if we look at winter days 50 years ago, 
why could this be not so, so a good idea to use to train a, a linear predictor? You, you would expect that winter days or the temperature development in winter days in Finland, uh, they are the same every year. Or what could be a problem here? Yeah, the years are not the same in general. Yes, climate change, climate change, exactly. So it, it might be a good idea to use only this historic data from the last three years. Or to somehow de de bias or detrend the historic data. Let's say we we say there's an average uh, increase in temperature by two degrees. So we we subtract this uh, two degrees, or we correct this uh, trend uh, in this historic data. So this would be a pre-processing of the of the training data. But this is beyond the scope of this course. So we assume we have access to good training data. Okay, so as I said, we can use any loss function, anything you want. However, there are a few choices that are very useful and uh, can be widely applied. Uh, one such choice is the squared error loss, which takes the prediction error and just computes the square. So it's non-negative and it's symmetric. So it doesn't matter if the error, if we are overshooting, if we are predicting the maximum daytime temperature too large or too small. It only depends on the deviation. <clears throat> this might be in some applications not, uh, not desirable. So in some applications you, you might want to never overestimate too much the temperature. So you might have a, a larger loss on the right than on the left. Yeah, and now we have already all three components. So we have arrived at uh, one machine learning method. We have chosen three components. So data, uh, the features are, re uh, data points are represented by real valued features or numbers. We have numeric labels, also typically modeled as a real number. We use a hypothesis based uh, linear functions or linear maps and loss function, the squared error loss. And the resulting method is called least squares regression. And this least squares regression is implemented in Python, for example, in order to find the best linear predictor that minimizes the squared error loss, you just uh, use this uh, method or function called linear regression dot fit. So you don't have to do any optimization with pen and paper anymore. You just call this function dot fit. And Python determines the optimal uh, linear predictor by finding the best values for this weight and the intercept. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, and then uh, by a slight variation, we get polynomial regression. So the only difference is here that the hypothesis space is the set of polynomial predictor maps. But this uh, polynomial regression is equivalent to linear least squares regression However, on a different set of features. So if you, if you use as features, not the original feature, but the powers of the feature, you, get, you can represent or you can change polynomial regression with linear least squares regression. So the properties of the squared error loss can be summarized as uh, it's a smooth uh, function. So minimizing the squared error loss is uh, a smooth convex optimization problem, which can be solved efficiently. Uh, I have sketched or pointed out the method last uh, lecture, which is called gradient descent. However, you don't need to know about gradient descent in this course because uh, this gradient descent, which minimizes or finds the minimum, finds the minimum of the squared error loss is uh, hidden for you in this dot fit function. So this dot fit function does it for us in this course. In the next, in the following course, Deep Learning with Python, which is uh, to start in September, uh, we will look more closely how this gradient descent works. But in this course, we just use the Python functions. Okay, uh, it has a nice interpretation 
uh, statistically optimal for Gaussian features. So this squared error <coughs> loss is, can be interpreted as a likelihood function or probability density for, for Gaussian features and labels. So it, it can be interpreted as a statistically optimal method, which is also nice. So it's somewhat optimal under certain assumptions. However, one drawback, and this might be a severe drawback, is that the squared error loss is sensitive to outliers. So what do I mean with uh, sensitivity to outliers? Well, in some cases, uh, or let's say in this uh, Finnish Meteorological Institute data, we might have some day which was completely different. So there was something very uh, extraordinary. It was extremely cold, let's say, in the morning or extremely cold on the daytime compared to the morning. So this is an outlier and we, we don't want to fit our predictor too much using this outlier. However, the squared error loss doesn't tolerate here a large difference because this loss, this loss function explodes fast. So the loss gets very fast, very large for larger prediction errors. So the loss, minimizing the squared error loss doesn't tolerate that this difference would be large. However, we would like to have this one, one prediction error to this outlier to be tolerated to be large. And for this, we, we should use another loss function, which is the absolute error loss. So instead of the squared error, we take just the absolute value of the prediction error. Uh, like the squared error loss, it's symmetric, but it doesn't grow so fast as the squared error loss. And this, in turn, uh, means that if we minimize, if we try to find a linear predictor using the, the absolute error loss, we tolerate for a few, here in this case only one data point, which is an outlier, we tolerate a large prediction error. And the resulting method, so again, we, we had chosen three components. So the, the data is represented by real valued features, um, or numeric features, and also a numeric label. The hypothesis space is the linear predictor, the space of linear predictor maps, uh, but the loss function is now different. We use the absolute error loss instead of the squared error loss. And this is then called mean absolute error regression. And uh, this is also represented by a, a Python object, but this Python object is more general. So I will first discuss a generalization or a, a generalization which contains the squared error loss and the absolute error loss as special cases. Uh, the absolute error loss is not the solution to everything uh, because it's a non-smooth optimization problem and it's more difficult. So it takes more computation to find the minimum of the, or the, the predictor which has the minimum absolute error loss. The problem is here, this point here. In this point, at this point, it's not smooth. There is no derivative at this point. There is a corner. And this one point, this one single point with a corner makes the, the minimization difficult. Okay, so there is a, a blend of the absolute error loss and the squared error loss, which is called the Huber loss. And the Huber loss does the following. It says, within a small band, uh, around zero prediction error, we use the squared error loss. And then we, we go over smoothly, we turn into the absolute error loss. So outside this band, we use the absolute error loss in order to tolerate outliers. But inside, around uh, close to the zero prediction error, we use the squared error loss to be able to optimize fast using smooth optimization methods or smooth convex optimization. So uh, when we look at the, at the data set, at the training data set, the Huber loss, defines a band around the predictor, which we tune, which we try to learn. Uh, in this band, we use the squared error loss, like in least squares regression, but outside the band, the errors are measured or quantified using the absolute error loss. So we can tolerate still a few outliers, but inside this band, we can do fast optimization like in squared error loss minimization. And the resulting uh, Python object is called Kuba regressor. And there is a parameter called epsilon, and this epsilon basically defines the width of this band within which we use the squared error loss, whereas outside this band, we use the absolute error loss. Okay, so 
this brings me already to the wrap up of this lecture. Um, regression methods and problems involve numeric labels. So regression is the special case or subset of machine learning involving numeric labels and numeric labels allow us to measure distances in uh, stark contrast to classification problems where there is no distance measure between different label values. So we can, we can use distance measures to measure the size or the loss functions. As loss functions, we can use distance measures like Euclidean distance to measure the size. And there are different popular or widely used choices like the squared error loss or the absolute error loss. Whereas the squared error loss is computationally attractive, absolute error loss is more robust to outliers. And the blend of those two is called the Hoover loss. Okay, that's all for today. Are there any questions at this point? There's one comment. I have problems understanding how loss function is applied. If I have a prediction and after this, I can calculate the error from, act, from the actual data point. After this, how do I apply the loss function? So if you have, uh, if you have a prediction, so you, you have a data point, like you download from the FMI one, one observation from last year, one day in February last year with minimum temperature XI and maximum daytime temperature YI. So you, and then you try out the predictor. You try out the predictor, which gives you this prediction based on, on, on this feature. Uh, so you get a prediction, let's say the prediction is prediction is for the maximum temperature is 10, uh, but the true label was three. So the prediction error is 10, 10 minus three is seven. Uh, and for this, we get the squared error loss is seven to the power of two, which is 49. And the absolute error loss would be seven. And we, we don't have only one prediction error, but we have a whole set of training data points. So what we do is we average. So we compute uh, the loss for this data point, for this data point, for this data point, and then we, we do an average, a simple arithmetic average. So we sum up all the losses and divide by the number of data points. That's how we get the loss function or the average loss function. Does this answer the, the question? somewhat. Okay, uh, so then there was another com comment. Will there be a sample data set on which a Python ML code is run and you could show us how it works? Yeah, for this are the, are the coding assignments. So I, I, I will not do this here in, in these lectures. Uh, we might do another uh, Zoom exercise session with, with live coding but uh, we did not get so much requests for this yet. So you should try this out in the coding assignments yourself. Um, uh, okay, so can you explain a bit of logistic regression? So logistic regression is a classification method. Um, and uh, this I will talk about in uh, the lecture on Wednesday. Although logistic regression has the word regression in its, in its name, it's a classification method, but I will talk more about this on Wednesday. Uh, okay, then another question. For Hoover loss, do we select the bandwidth or epsilon in beforehand or can we tune it on the fly? Uh, excellent question. So this epsilon, uh, you need to, to choose it or tune it. And you can, for example, use uh, model validation or cross validation techniques, which we will discuss in uh, round four. So there are principled ways to try out different values for this bandwidth or epsilon and then pick a good, a good choice. Um, okay, so there's another comment. So a coding exercise comes with a tutorial sample and then we submit set problem. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the coding assignments on, on Jupyter Hub contain also demos, so with ready-made Python functions. So I highly recommend to, to check out the Jupyter Hub uh, uh, notebooks, or notebook, uh, notebooks on Jupyter Hub. And regarding questions, uh, for questions regarding these notebooks, please 
uh, use the Slack channels for the rounds. For example, if you have a question on the round two notebook, use the round two channel in Slack. Um, so, but, uh, for, is the use case of loss function just to help to find the better hypothesis function? Yes. So the, the only reason why we use a loss function is to, to find a good hypothesis function. Without a loss function, uh, there, there, it's meaningless to talk about a good predictor function because we need to measure somehow the quality of a predictor function. So a loss function is exactly what defines the measure or the size of the prediction error. Without a loss function, uh, it's meaningless to, to look for a good predictor because you don't have a measure that tells you how good is a predictor. So, there's another comment. Is the continuation course starting in September going to be available on FITECH? Yes, uh, it will be available on FITECH, exactly like this course. So it's called Deep Learning with Python, and I think it's an excellent continuation of this course. <clears throat> so, what would it mean to fit a model with or without intercept? So the intercept gives you more flexibility. If you, for example, if you have here uh, no intercept, then you only have the possibility to change the slope of a linear predictor. <clears throat> and sometimes this can, can be very uh, uh, misleading because consider you have, a, you have a data point like this. Uh, you have training sets like this. So you have a few data points like this. So we forget about this one here now. So ideally you would say there is uh, like this trend here. But this, uh, this predictor function you only can use if you, if you allow a non-zero intercept term. If you would fit a, a linear function to this data points without an intercept, you would get this, something like this. And this predictor function would give you the impression that somehow the label will become larger for larger features. Although in reality, the label should get the label value become smaller for larger features. But you cannot, uh, you cannot take this effect or you cannot model this effect because you don't have an intercept at your disposal. So an intercept term gives you more flexibility to fit uh, data sets to fit data sets which, which have some offset, for example, some offset or drift. Okay, so um, what if I would like to predict those outliers that is anomalies in the data? What is the model? So I don't understand the question, what is the model, but you, you can detect the outliers. Well, you could detect the outliers by first fitting a linear predictor which is tolerant to outliers so which doesn't care about outliers using a absolute error loss and then you look at the prediction errors you measure the the size of the prediction errors and you you then identify outliers simply by those which have the largest predict, prediction errors that that would be one naive way to detect outliers so first fit fit a, a linear predictor which is tolerant or ignores outliers. And then when you have found such a fitted uh, linear predictor, look for the data points which are very bad predicted. Then you get the outliers. <clears throat> so, then another comment, what is the intolerance to outliers? What leads to overfitting in models? Um, so I will talk more about overfitting in round four. Uh, but in general, I would say that intolerance to outliers is basically not leading to overfitting, ra rather opposite. Intolerance to outliers is, is helping to prevent overfitting. But I will talk more about overfitting in round four. Another comment, do you ever clean your outliers? Uh, yes, I think this is a very important uh, part of, of data pre-processing or data cleaning uh, because Everything that you see by eye, by looking at the data set, for example, doing a scatter plot and is clearly an outlier, you should remove immediately. 
this, this removes the burden of finding, for example, a loss function that is intolerant, uh, that is robust to outliers. Because this, this always comes with a bit drawbacks. For example, here, uh, using the absolute error loss such that it is intolerant to outliers slows down the learning because minimizing the absolute error loss is slow. If you would in otherwise first be sure or manually remove out all outliers, then you can use the squared error loss and this is fast. So it, it might be very, very beneficial to, to remove outliers first. So, so another comment, so we use no intercept when we know from real world that the label is zero when the feature is zero as well. Uh, so in general, it's, it's always good to use outliers. Uh, uh, to, sorry, to use an intercept term. It doesn't cost too much. It, it cannot harm your method too much or the overall approach. And it, it gives you way more flexibility to, to handle data points which have some offset. Otherwise, you, you need to make sure that, uh, that the offset is zero, which you can do, for example, by removing any, any sample mean. So uh, a typical pre-processing step is to remove, uh, to compute the average of all feature values and remove the average. And then, for example, you can, uh, you can avoid the intercept. But having an intercept doesn't cost too much computationally and, and helps you to avoid uh, pitfalls, like uh, fitting a... Uh, fitting a linear curve to, to such a, a data set, fitting a, a linear curve without an intercept, and then concluding that the label value increases with feature value, which is clearly not the case here. <clears throat> There's another comment. What if the regression models aims to predict sales through marketing spend? Could we make the assumption that there shouldn't be an intercept? Well, this depends on the domain. Uh, I'm not an expert in, in, in these business models. Uh, might be or might not be, but in general, I would highly recommend to to keep the intercept term. Uh, it's it's just user friendly. It it avoids pitfalls and it doesn't cost too much computation. Uh, another comment: What is the implication of removing outliers? Uh, well, removing outliers uh, makes your methods more accurate, so it it only helps. But you need to be sure to remove an outlier and not a a, a regular data point, which just indicates that the relation between um, for example, this feature X and Y is, is like this. So in this case, it seems that this is really an outlier because all these points line up at the straight line. But in some applications, it's, it's not clear cut what is an outlier and what not. Okay, any other comments or questions? Yeah, another comment, will some useful information be lost if we remove outliers? Well, if you remove outliers that you think are outliers but are not outliers in reality, yes, then you will, use, uh, then you will lose uh, useful information. That's a risk, yes. <clears throat> another comment, what if outliers form a pattern? For example, on the first week of January for every year, there's a, an extremely cold day. So if they form a pattern, then I would not call them outliers anymore, but then they are part of, of, the, of the relation between, or they are indicators of a nonlinear relation between features and labels, and then you should use a more powerful nonlinear predictor instead of removing them. So one comment, how, how to really detect outliers. Uh, there is a, a whole uh, field of machine learning called anomaly detection, which uh, aims at developing methods to detect outliers. But the basic idea is, as I said, for all those methods, fit a predictor or fit the model that is robust to outliers, and then find the data points that are way off this predictor. Yeah, another comment, How should we, when should we decide if a data is outlier or not? This depends heavily on the application. There is no general rule for that. I'm sorry. <clears throat> okay. So we are now through with one hour. Uh, let's keep it with one hour. If you have more questions, please do not hold back and ask on Slack or by email. I'm always happy to receive questions and to answer questions. And otherwise, uh, we meet tomorrow again at 6, where we will have uh, Maria Rebinder giving very important guidelines on the legal aspects of, of using machine learning. Thanks a lot and have a nice evening. Bye.